Bless the Lord who forgiveth all our sins. Endureth forever. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from thy ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of thy word. Jesus Christ, thy Son, who with thee and the Holy Spirit liveth and reigneth, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading, a reading from the book of Genesis. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, then he said to him, 
so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chal Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The word of the Lord.
<clears throat> the Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. At that very hour, came and said to Jesus, <clears throat> Get away from me, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out before today I, on the day I finished my work yet today tomorrow because it is those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather my children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The, the Holy Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray is be to thee, O Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. It is the second Sunday of Lent, and this morning let us look at this gospel before us. According to tradition, St. Luke was the first iconographer. And in the gospel before us this morning, we are presented with two pictures. A picture of man, the common man, humanity, and a picture of the Son of God. We are given a picture of the Son of God in the glory of his person and manner, and a picture of humanity who knows who he is, who is familiar with him, but who does not understand him, who cannot see him or understand the purpose for which he came. That is the condition of the Pharisees, and it is our condition. It is a picture of humanity without the gospel of who our Lord is and what he came to do. The church has been given, as Origen said, an early church theologian, one gospel in four books. 
The gospel writers did not write from a critical distance. They did not remove themselves from the events that took place during the life of Christ. And on the surface of it, the gospel according to Luke is an example of the work of an author concerned with the details of history. He talks about the miracles, the signs that accompanied our Lord's ministry, and the moral and religious content of his teaching. In addition to being the first iconographer, uh, St. Luke was also a physician, and so he had an eye for detail. And he was also a a historian. He outlines for us the disputes Jesus had with the two factions that we see in today's gospel, the Herodians, the politicians of Jesus' day, and the Pharisees, the religious leaders. But as a physician, St. Luke is also concerned with Jesus as the great physician who has come to earth to bring the medicine of immortality, what the early church called the Eucharist, this miraculous food we partake of in the Mass. St. Luke was also interested in the priestly themes of Jesus' life. From the beginning of Luke's Gospel, when Zechariah is offering his Levitical sacrifice in the temple, and the angel Gabriel stands before him and announces the birth of John the Baptist. Or at Candlemas, when we remember the offering of Jesus as a child at the presentation. And recall how on that early visit to Jerusalem as a child, as an adolescent, Jesus visited the temple where he conversed with the priests and the scholars of the law. St. Luke is concerned with portraying Jesus in his priestly role, indeed the great high priest, so beautifully explained by the, the book of Hebrews. The purpose of Luke's gospel was not to give an unbiased account of Jesus' life, to just give the facts like the news purports to do. The gospel according to St. Luke, is a romance. And interpreting scripture is a romantic enterprise. It concerns a person. And Luke gives us a passionate narrative about the person and work of Christ. And from the start of this journey Jesus makes towards Jerusalem, this chapter's long journey following the transfiguration when our Savior sets his eyes like flint, turns his face towards Jerusalem, and does not look back. In the course of this journey, St. Luke makes the purpose for which Christ came clear. He portrays it in a series of four stages, and by this 13th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, we see with devastating clarity the meaning of our Lord's way and journey to Jerusalem. And along this way, Luke highlights the mystery of this great high priest, the knowledge he possessed, and the purpose for which he came. At that very hour, some Pharisees came In the course of this journey, these four stages of Jesus' journey towards Jerusalem, St. Luke introduces each one with a question that is asked to Jesus, a question any one of us may ask in the course of the Christian life. And this question, following a disaster when people's minds are concerned with ultimate things, they approach Jesus and ask, how many will be saved? Jesus' answer is unsettling. For our Savior did not say, this is how many will be saved. His concern was not with how many, but who will be saved and how. 
He goes on to make it clear that all kinds of people from the north and the south, from the east and the west will be saved. There will be a surprising guest list at this great banquet of God. Gentiles from the world over will join Abraham and Isaac and Jacob at God's banquet. But just as Jesus is answering this question, the Pharisees arrive to put him to the test. And Jesus corrects the Pharisees' fatal misunderstanding that merely being a descendant of Abraham according to the flesh, even their familiarity with Jesus in the flesh, and that their serious, overwhelming, almost burdensome keeping of the law was not the way to salvation. Jesus reminds them, or perhaps tells them for the first time, that the way to this great banquet of God, the way to join their forefathers, the heroes of faith, is through a narrow door. Indeed, it is a door for some, a way, but a barrier for others. The mystery of the gospel is not esoteric knowledge. It isn't conjured by a spell. It isn't earned after passing a series of tests. But what is hidden in the gospel, indeed what is hidden in all of scripture, is not a secret but the riches of the person of the Son of God, his majesty and his glory. And if we but look, if we turn the pages looking for him, a picture emerges. This is the picture the Pharisees missed. And he stood before him in his own flesh, before their very eyes. They could have reached out and touched him. And yet for us in this time where we do not see God, either in the flesh of his son, or in the glory of his dwelling place. The scriptures are for us now the face of God. As our psalm says for today, thou hast said, seek my face. My heart says to thee, thy face, Lord, do I seek. And in the light of the gospel, in the light of the countenance of Christ discerned in the pages of Holy Scripture, all things become gospel. Even this strange, intense encounter with the Pharisees reveals that the Son of God and his glory cannot be hidden. St. Paul reminds us that we have put away as Christians the, the craftiness, the deceit, the hidden things of dishonesty, those tools with which we hid from God in the past. Recall Adam and Eve trying to hide from God and those devastating words from God, where are you? If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, that are blinded by the God of this age, lest the light of the glorious gospel the image of God, the face of Christ, shine upon them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. For God has commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so in the midst of this answer that Jesus gives about the mystery of salvation, the sorrowful and beautiful mystery of his person, the Pharisees come to test Jesus, and they fabricate a threat to his life. They present themselves as well-meaning at first. Their intentions are perhaps ambiguous, because they seem to give our Lord a chance to escape a premature, untimely death. A death like his cousins, like John the Baptist's at the hand of Herod. 
but their hearts betray their familiarity. And the picture of these Pharisees that Luke paints is a picture of man that Jesus knows. Jesus knows their intentions. Jesus knows what is in man. Remember the story of Jesus calling the disciple Nathanael. Jesus noted this Israelite sitting under a tree and approached him and said that in him there was no deceit. Then Jesus astonished Nathanael by telling him that he had seen him sitting under the fig tree, a symbol of the Torah, revealing that Jesus knew Nathanael mysteriously, intimately, that Jesus' knowledge was personal and this was all Nathanael needed to know. We don't know the details of what Jesus saw, but Nathanael did. And when he saw the face of Christ, he responded and followed him. John is careful in his own gospel to note that many believed in Jesus when they saw these signs which he did. But Jesus did not trust himself to these witnesses. Jesus knew all he needed to know about man because he was both God and man. And no one had to bear witness of man to Christ for he himself knew what is in man, what is in you and me. Jesus knows the truth behind these Pharisees' words, and he knows that Herod poses no real threat to his ministry. King Herod, who only killed John the Baptist to please his murdered brother's wife, Herod, who was a kind of puppet king with power on loan from Rome, Jesus says in these biting words, tell that fox, tell that Herod, I am going nowhere because of him. Today I'm going to cast out demons and heal the sick, and tomorrow I am going to preach and raise the dead. You who murdered your brother and took his wife, you have no real power of your own. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down that I may take it up again. And you Pharisees, you foxes, you who know the scriptures and yet do not know me, you are the ones who truly want me dead. But this is what I will do. Today and tomorrow I will continue my work. And on the third day it will be perfected. And so Jesus repeats, that today, tomorrow, and the next day, a colloquial way of saying, I'm gonna do exactly what I intend to do because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside Jerusalem. And then we see how his person and work, the knowledge he has and the signs he performs are one. And we see how they are meant to be perfected. The Herodians and Pharisees divided our Lord's person and work. The Lord Jesus did nothing but good. He was humanity's greatest benefactor. Indeed, all he did was a testament to his identity of the Son of God. But those who were familiar with him and tried to separate the deeds of our Lord, the miracles he did, and to take his life without his death did not see a true image of the Son of God. They were, as our second reading today read, says, enemies of the cross. But Jesus saw himself with devastating clarity. And then the Savior, who is both fully God and fully man, by whom all things were made, the Lord who made a people for himself, delivered them out of bondage, and who then came among his own, a sacrifice in a manger, an offering at the temple, a priest among a people of priests, speaks as the Alpha and Omega, and says, Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. This image, seemingly out of nowhere, is not a quaint image. It is a devastating image, this hen with her brood. It is a holocaust. It is an image of immolation. And it is also the ultimate image of divine love, expressed in the image of a mother and her child. It is an image of sacrifice. The mother hen would die so that her children may live, the one for the many. This ultimate image of love, like the two pictures we are presented with in this gospel of the glory of the Son of God and of us, is meant to challenge our familiarity to shake us out of our indifference. Lent is a time to look at these two pictures. A picture of humanity and all our cunning, our cleverness, our attempts to deceive and hide from God, and an image of the crucified and risen one, the glory of God in the face of his Son. For thou hast said, seek my face. My heart says to thee, thy face, Lord, do I seek. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man, was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who sake by the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church and the world, especially Ukraine. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. Receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. 
and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Michael, our primate, Michael, our assisting bishop, Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Leander, our dean, that they may, both in their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. We also pray for our sister cathedral in this city, the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, and for their clergy and people, especially Edward, their bishop, and Anthony, their rector. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also, so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joseph, our president, Kathleen, our governor, and Kathleen, our mayor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world, especially in the Ukraine. Open, O oh Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, we may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O oh Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We pray of thy gracious mercy for an end to this worldwide pandemic. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Michael Bedell. Beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace, so to follow the good examples of Blessed Mary, the ever Virgin Mother of God, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator an advocate. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty God, Father, Father of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ maker, maker of all things, things judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, beseeching most justly thy wrath and indignation against us, which we earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have, have mercy upon us. Have, have mercy, mercy upon us, us, most merciful Father. For our Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may evermore and further serve and please Thee in newness and life to the honor and glory of Thy name. Through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of His great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins, to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail 
and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a true saying, worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. Peace. Peace, 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 peace. Please be seated for a few announcements. Um, Holy Communion is open to all baptized Christians. And um, if you've been baptized with water in the name of the Trinity, whatever your church background, you're invited warmly to receive communion here today. If you're not baptized, have some other reason not to receive. If you come forward and cross your arms, you'll receive a blessing. Everyone is welcome at God's altar here today. We'll have two stations for communion today uh, at the high altar and at the crossing. And um, um, and we'll, we'll be offering both species and do whatever makes you feel safe and comfortable. A communion of one kind, of course, is completely valid. Uh, do come back at 2.30 this afternoon for an organ recital by Dr. Brian Taylor, who is the organist at St. George's in Schenectady, is a brilliant organist, and then immediately followed at 3 o'clock by uh, an even song. Uh, now let us offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and make good our vows to the Most High.
The Lord be with you. And with my spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet and right in our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was in every way tempted as we are and yet did not sin, by whose grace we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying,
All glory be to the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of a whole world, and an institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue, a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all of the benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body in him, and we with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him, and although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Lord, who art in heaven,
We do not presume to come to this thy. Trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost feed us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood. And dost assure us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members and corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.